Friends, we have a new pronunciation for an old word. From now we're going to say confrontation. <laughs> and ironically, that's what we're talking about today. Last week, Jamie Stadola and my colleague began a series entitled Tangled, subtitled When Conflict Snarls Your Relational Wires. She began by suggesting to us that actually conflict just might be the deepest intimacy in a relationship, a new thought. Conflict is reality. We can't escape it. This week, we come to take a second step on that journey. But this week, we come to try to answer a question, wade into thoughts about how to answer a question that is not a question I have heard dealt with in a sermon. In fact, I realized I had personally have never preached on it, and I've never heard a sermon on it. But it's a key question. And that question is this. What do you do? Does the Bible have any wisdom to suggest when you face an irreparable conflict? No way to repair it. It's gone beyond that possibility. Is there any wisdom that Scripture gives us for such moments? Three brief stories. Details have been changed to protect the innocent as well as the guilty. First, as many years ago, I was a young pastor in a smaller church. And there was a battle going on between two families in the church over the custody of a child. There's not much that will inflame passions more quickly than our little ones. These two families were locked in mortal combat, it seemed. In fact, you've seen videos, no doubt, on YouTube of, of bucks or elk or at time even moose who with their large rack of antlers have been fighting and they've gotten locked together and they cannot get apart. If they don't manage to get apart, it's going to mean the death of them both. It was that kind of situation. It spilled over onto others in the church, and it wasn't just the fact that it was a relational conflict in the church. Now it had become a legal battle in the court, which only intensified the feelings. That was years before I had, been giving, had given much thought to or study to family systems theory. But in later years, thinking back about that from that vantage point, I thought, I'm not sure even that would have helped all that much because the people were just not at a place where they were willing to engage in that way. And it left me with that lingering question. What do you do when conflict is irreparable? Second story. Couple locked in a divorce battle. Kids are a bit older now. But there are deep and passionate feelings of no doubt pain, although that's not what was most obvious. What was most obvious on the surface, surface was almost, I would say, almost fury. Just the white hot heat of wounded people who were blaming it all on that person. What had begun as I do became I can't and finally I want. What had started with stars in their eyes, candles in their hands, and love in their hearts now had become a battle not only to get away from, but to damage the other in any way possible. And the onlookers, the ones on which this was washing over their lives, were called children. Adult, yes, but children. And it left me wondering, is there any wisdom, any biblical wisdom, when conflict has become irreparable? Third story. An uncle and a nephew. Now, when we think about even extended family, we think about filial pride and joy and togetherness, and certainly this had that component at least earlier on in the relationship. But then this uncle and this nephew made a decision that most would say, don't do that. Too. Don't do that. But they did it anyway. They did something that is often recommended strongly against for family and friends. They got into business together. And from there, the decline began. Down, down it went until there was, there was Every kind of thing you can imagine going on in the relationship between the two of them. Scheming, conniving, manipulating, lying, blaming, everything you can imagine. It just got worse and worse. Every attempt to fix it was not working until finally the nephew said, I'm done with this. I can't do this anymore. And he left. 
disappeared. But it leaves us with that lingering question. What do you do? When conflict so snarls your relational wires, there's no way to fix it. It's an important question. Does the Bible offer wisdom to that? Now, before we try to wade into that in our Scripture for today, I want to state the obvious because this has to be in the background for any time we talk about a topic like this, and that is this. This is a book of reconciliation. God calls us to reconciliation. We are to work for reconciliation. We are to be peacemakers. That's God's ultimate design for the entire planet, in fact, the entire universe, that we would all be made one in Christ. That's the goal for every one of us. But having said that, we live on a sin-saturated planet, and what that means is this. I define sin primarily in terms of brokenness, broken relationships, broken relationships with ourselves, with others, and with God. And because that's the reality for every human being, it means that even if you are on one side of this conflict and you're saying, I want to do everything I can to repair this, if the other person is not engaging, then that possibility is lost. Which means we have to ask that question. What do we do when conflict is irreparable. So let's go back to that story, that third story, the uncle and the nephew. The uncle's name was Laban. The nephew's name was Jacob. It started well. In fact, it started with great joy and celebration when Jacob arrived at Laban's household. It wasn't long before they became family in more than one way as Jacob married into the family. And soon he was caring for the flocks and herds, the family business, and they grew, and he was starting to get wealthy. And then the accusations began, and Jacob conniving and scheming behind the scenes, and Laban trying to rob him of what he was earning, and anger, and it just kept building in intensity until they had been locked in this conflict for almost 20 years. And finally, Jacob said, enough. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And left. When Laban got word of that, his fury almost knew no bounds. Hot on Jacob's tail, he was going to find him, and he was going to wreak vengeance on him. So much so that it appears that physical harm was very much in the possible picture. And God appears to him the night before he finally meets Jacob and says to him, Laban, Laban, check yourself. Back up. Don't you lay a hand on him. And that sets the stage for when they finally encounter each other. Now, when they encounter each other, Jacob at first blows up. He gives this long speech where he's saying, why are you still after me? What have I done? I'm not the one at fault here. And he, he lists what has happened over the 20 years. And Laban has a reply. So we're going to look at that in Genesis chapter 31. Genesis 31, we join the story in progress. As, as Jacob is coming to the end of his speech, and he is, he is stating what he now knows, that God has appeared to Laban and has said, don't mess with him. So here we are, Genesis 31, starting in verse 42. Jacob's words, If the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac, had not been with me, you surely would have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. Laban answered Jacob, The women are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All right, you got a point. They are your daughters, and those are your grandkids. But hang on a second. He's still in a mindset that says, this is mine. You're at fault. I need what's coming to me. In fact, he says, all you see is mine. Yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine or about the children they have born? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. It seems like things are getting a little better. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. He said to his relatives, his own relatives, come gather, or gather some stones, 
So they took stones and piled them in a heap. Laban called it Jagor Sahadutha, and Jacob called it Galid. They can't even agree on the name of the place. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. That's why it was called Galid. It was also called Mizpah because he said, may the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters, of which there is no evidence, by the way, if you mistreat my daughters or if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. As you read the story, if you read the full account, at certain points it's almost as, there's, as though there's two tellings of the account. Now, some scholars say, well, there are some reasons for that, doubtless legitimate. But one question I have is about the fact that they still can't agree. They're still at a point where they are, are in conflict, locked in battle, each trying to get his point validated. So finally, Laban says, all right, let's make a covenant. Let's set up a monument as a reminder. And Jacob sets it up, gets his men to help put it together. And the evidence that Jacob is in agreement with this, even though Laban has suggested it, is not only that he helps build the monument, but that he sits down and eats the covenant meal together. So we're good, right? It's all good. It's all happy now. Kind of like what I used to hear. Beautiful song. It was also our children here at this church. At the end of the children's choir and orchestra year, at the end of the academic year, there would be a concert that they would put on for our church congregation. And one of the songs they always performed, always sang, was called simply Mizpah. A beautiful song. Kimo found an old video of it for me this week, and I watched it again, saw, even saw our own kids in there, and remembered. It's a melancholy melody that has a certain sentimental reality to it that, that talks about the sweet sorrow of parting and the fact that there's a cherished hope of reunion to come. As the kids are ending their school year, they're all going away their own directions, but we'll be back together, and God will watch over us while we're apart. It's a beautiful song. I love it. But that's not what this is. That's not what Jacob and Laban are doing. So two quotes from two different Old Testament commentaries. The first one comes from a commentary set that is written by the United Bible Societies with the purpose of helping Bible translators who are trying to translate the Bible into new receptor languages. The commentary is written to help translators understand the full depth and richness of either Hebrew or Greek and catch the nuance so that when now they're translating it into this language, they can capture that. So that's where the first quote comes from. It is talking about that line, the Lord watched between you and me. That's the beautiful line of the song. The Lord will care for us when we're apart from each other. His eye will be on us. Well, not to disappoint you, here's the quote. The Lord watched between you and me. Laban is here calling on the Lord to keep watch, spy on, be on the lookout. This is not a prayer for the Lord to take care of these two men while they are apart, as is sometimes prayed by Christians. Rather, it is a plea that the Lord will be vigilant to catch the one who is preparing to harm the other. That's his prayer. It's like, I don't trust you further than I can see you. So when I can't see you, I'm going to call on God to keep his eye on you so that you don't do something untoward and unfortunate. That's how much of a lack of trust there is in this relationship. That's what he's praying for. Let God spy on you, keep an eye on you, because if not, I can't trust what you're going to do. So how does Jacob feel about that? Well, another commentary, Old Testament scholar Victor Hamilton writes about Jacob's response with these words. Jacob responds to Laban only with action. He ignores Laban conversationally. Laban had said, let's make a pact. Jacob first builds a pillar, then responds not to Laban, but to his own kinsman, collects some stones. In the original Hebrew, Jacob has only two words in this whole episode. Jacob is giving Laban the silent treatment. I'm done talking. 
It's pointless with you. I have nothing more to say. And yet he goes about the building of the altar, and he also participates in eating the covenant meal. So he is agreeing to something, even though it seems he's checked out in terms of engaging, while Laban is still trying to push it, push it, and make it happen. What is it that is at the core of what they agree to do? That's our question. Because what we're asking is, does the Bible have any wisdom when conflict gets irreparable. I want you to listen. Two verses, Genesis 31, 51, and 52. This is the reality upon which they agree. All the other things that they're disagreeing on, here's something they agree on. Verse 51, Laban also said to Jacob, here is this heap, and here is this pillar I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness that, and this is their agreement, I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you, and that you will not go past this heap and pillar to this side to harm me. That's their agreement. We can't get along. It's as though they're saying, we can't get along. We don't like each other. We don't want to be around each other. We fight all the time. This can't continue. We're destroying each other. But there's one thing on which we can actually agree. We're going to draw a line in the sand, and we're going to put this pile of stones and this pillar in the midst of it and say, this is Mizpah. I will not cross this to go hurt you, and you will not cross this to come harm me. And it's as though they say, deal. What do you do when conflict is irreparable? How do you face that? Sorry to repeat this, but the desire God has for us is reconciliation. More on that next week. Let me be very clear about that. But because of the fractures that sin causes in the human makeup, there are times when it cannot be repaired. Maybe Jacob and Laban have found a way forward. So I want you to think about something. I want to encourage you to consider doing something. I'd like to encourage you to consider going out and get something that is present in abundance in Southern California, okay? Go out and get a stone or a rock, or if you're in a really bad conflict, get a boulder, big old boulder. Put it in your car, take it home, wash it all off, and then play the artist on it. You can paint a background. You can do whatever you want to do with it and make it look good enough to be in your house. But what you do want to do is take that, that, that artist palette with the brush and the paint and paint on their mizpah. And then, and then set it, I don't know, by your front door so that when you're just rushing out the door to go see that forgiven piece of, whoa, mizpah. When you're getting, maybe put it in your bathroom. When you're getting ready in the morning, put it in your office. People come in and say, what's that? That's Mizpah. Oh, I love that. That's a beautiful song. May the Lord watch you. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful song. It's keeping me from killing somebody right now. But anyway, consider going out and getting some stone, rock, boulder, paint Mizpah on it and say, I am going to make a covenant commitment Maybe not with the other person. They may not be willing. But I will make it before God that there is a boundary, there is a limit that I will no longer pass to create hurt or harm in their life. So maybe you say, well, we'll unpack that just a little bit. What exactly am I deciding? Be more specific. All right, I will. Thank you for asking. I want to have, I want, I have three suggestions I'd like you to consider. Consider as possible choices to make as a part of a Mizpah boundary in your life. Number one, choose to limit the words you speak. 
Choose to limit the words you speak. That is extremely difficult. You wonder how hard it is? Read the book of James in the New Testament. James is basically saying, if you can control the tongue, you can control anything. You're, he even says, you're, you're perfect if you can do that. Well, it's a high calling. But if you're going to have a mispa boundary in your life, choose to limit the words you speak. There will be moments when the other party, whoever that is, an angry neighbor, a disaffected friend, an estranged family member, a former spouse who is causing you misery, there will be times when the things they do, the things they say, are intended to go straight through your heart. And your desire will be to lash back. And then you remember Mizpah. I've made a covenant with God. I need God's grace, I need God's strength, I need God's power. But what that covenant means is that I have made the choice to limit the words I speak. Story. Now, some of you are aware of this story. Some of you know this story. Some of you don't. Whenever I think about the tongue, I always remember this story told by John Ortberg. Former pastor, has written a lot. He had gone down to USC to sit as a guest in a class on philosophy. The professor was Dallas Willard, an excellent philosopher and a profoundly committed follower of Jesus, apprentice to Jesus. So he was mentoring Ortberg. So Ortberg went and sat in his class. Toward the end of the class, there was something that Willard said that one of the students took issue with, and the student raised his hand. And, and then was, according to Ortberg, was, was really inappropriate how he laid into the professor. And, and, and it was just disrespectful. And Ortberg said he's feeling awkward about it. But it's not only that. It's also that the student was wrong. Even Ortberg, sitting there as a guest, knew he was wrong. So the student finally finishes. This is near the end of the class. Finally finishes. And Ortberg says, Willard kind of stood there and thought about it. And then he said, um, I think that's a good place to end for today. So we'll see you next time. Ortberg's like, what's that? What? What? And the students, he can't wait for the students to get out. And he goes up to Willard and he says, what, what happened there at the end? He not only disrespected you, he was wrong. Why didn't you correct him? Willard thought about it a minute. And he said, well, lately I've been practicing the discipline of not having the last word. Wow. I love that story. I hate that story. <laughs> because I want to have the last word. But what if this week that person with whom you have locked horns, when you are ready to wade in, lambaste them and lay them out because you know they're wrong. What if you remember that boulder by your front door, Mizpah, and you choose to limit the words you speak? You're not crossing that boundary to further damage them. That's the first choice you might consider. Second choice, not only choose to limit the words you speak, but secondly, choose to honor the boundary you set. So you've set a boundary. Now the question is, are you going to choose to honor the boundary you've set? I want to say something that I think is true. Maybe you can tell me after the service I'm wrong, and if you make a convincing case, I'll agree. But I don't think I am wrong a lot of times, but I don't think I'm wrong on this one. If you choose to honor the boundary you set, you will not be able to do that alone. Just that simple. You will not be able to do that alone. Now, obviously, you will need the power of the Spirit of God in your heart, in your life, strengthening you to live to what He's calling you to do. That goes without saying. But here's another piece of that reality. Often God chooses people as the way He reaches us. People. 
You will need someone or a small group of someones in your life if you are going to choose to honor the boundary you set. I don't know who that is, a friend, a family member, a colleague at work, a neighbor, pastor, a counselor, therapist. I don't know. But you will need someone where, with whom you can process the realities that you're facing and someone who loves you and cares about you enough to look you in the eye when you know next week another encounter is coming and to say to you, you know I'm in your corner. You know I'm praying for you. You know I support you. Remember Mizpah. Mm. Accountability. Because at times, if the person on the other side of this conflict is not at that place, there's something they will do that will make it very hard for you to honor the boundary you have set. Years ago, not long after Nita and I got married, we were in the office of a marriage therapist. There was someone with whom I was kind of locked in conflict at that time, and I'll never forget what the therapist said to me. It was a very simple metaphor, but it stuck with me. He said, Randy, when this person is engaged with you on that and, and, and you decide, he was using different terminology, but to honor the boundary you have set, they're not going to like that. And they're going to be like a fisherman with a rod and reel. And they're going to go, Whoosh. and as you're walking out, they're going to catch and they're going to start trying to reel you back in. And the way they reel you back in is by an inflammatory statement they make, a name they call you, a challenge they lay out, and everything is you're going to want to go, you know, I want to go back. You're going to need accountability. You're going to need help. You can't do it alone. But if you want to deal in a divinely wise way with irreparable conflict, you may want to choose to honor the boundary you've set. So if you have Mizpah there in your house, your bathroom, your office, you may want to choose to limit the words you speak, choose to honor the boundary you've set, but thirdly also, choose to consider the future you face. Choose to consider the future you face. You know that every time we make decisions, it will have some kind of effect on our future, good or bad. It just does that. There are so many times I've done or, or, for example, said things that as soon as they came out of my mouth, I thought, why did you say that? I want to run after and get those words, push them back in my mouth. I mean, technology has reached the degree where you can, at least for a period of time, unsend a text or unsend an email. You can't do that with the words you speak. When they're out there, they're out there. And they will begin to create a future. If it's a small, low-level decision, it may not do much damage. If it's much bigger than that, wow, the pain, the pain. Pastors have certain privileges for me, one of them was what I got to do this morning with little Jonathan, a child dedication. What, what, what an honor and a privilege. Another one is a wedding. The honor of being able to officiate at a wedding when two, two people are joining their lives together and you're looking here at this groom and bride and thinking of all the joy in their hearts. They're there with love in their hearts and candles in their hands and stars in their eyes and looking forward to a future. It's a beautiful moment. But that moment is preceded by certain things. It's preceded by a period of time of premarital counseling, and it's also preceded by a, a time, a session or two, of wedding ceremony planning. I've had the honor of doing that on more than a few occasions. And once or twice, uh, well, honestly, I wish it were only once or twice. But there have been those moments when I've sat with a couple who then says, when we're talking about who's marching with who and seating arrangements, one will look at the other and say, what are we going to do about your parents? They've been divorced 15 years, and they can't be in the same room together. 
there's that much bile and vitriol, anger. Didn't start that way. But somewhere along the road, people become so focused on winning this conflict, winning this battle, defeating the other person, that there's a tendency to forget that there's a future that's coming. That these little ones, crumb crunchers who are crawling around today, are one day going to sit in a marriage therapist's office and talk about that, or a pastor's office and plan the wedding. So when you're locked in that combat, especially if it's with an ex-spouse who is making your life miserable, just remember this. Consider the future you face. You can't do anything about them. Let's just state that very clearly. They may be ahead of you in coming to peace, and if so be, if that's the case, then, then, then praise the Lord and pass the donuts. Let's celebrate. But they may be at a very different place and have no interest in what you're doing. You can't control that, but what you can control is your response, what you choose to do. So make a choice to remember the future you face. Because how you handle this irrepar irreparable context, conflict, will have an impact on the future. Let me tell you this, future of these two, Jacob and Laban. Think about this. Jacob, who, for, for my money, reading his story, even reading this incident, he is not innocent. Let me be very clear about that. After all, even his name means schemer. I, he's not innocent. But he's in not as bad a shape as Laban is in, in terms of vindictive nature and revenge, retaliation, all of that. And Jacob goes from this place to walk with God, to strive with God, to choose God's ways. Do you know what that meant for his future? It meant, means that over and over again, almost no matter where you go in this book, Jacob is all over its pages. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or by his other name. God said, I'm no longer going to call you schemer. I'm going to call you Israel. And through you, I'm going to bring a message of salvation that will encircle the globe. That's his future. Laban, who is still at this point in time trying to justify himself, fighting with Jacob, and except for God's intervention, this situation may have ended very badly. Except for a mention here and there and maybe a genealogy or a location, something like that, except for that, Laban disappears from the narrative, disappears. What we choose today will bear fruit tomorrow. So maybe you want Mizpah, that boundary. I will not cross this line to harm you, to hurt you anymore. What does that practically mean? Well, Maybe it means you choose to limit the words you say. You choose to honor the boundary you set. And you choose to consider the future you face. You know, I couldn't help it as, as I was reading this and thinking about this. There was a line that kept coming back to me. It's a line that's associated with the Hippocratic Oath that any of you who are physicians have taken. It's that line, first do no harm. It's kind of the bottom shelf. The Whatever else you might do, first do no harm. Isn't that what this boundary is saying? You know, the two families at the beginning, child custody battle, divorce, there wasn't reconciliation. Nobody sat around a campfire holding hands singing Kumbaya. But they did lay down their weapons. They did call a ceasefire. And do you know that sometimes that's the best we can do? It just is. It's not the best God can do, but it's the best we can do. So first, 
do no harm. Set up a mizpah in your own life. And just know that when conflict is irreparable, the grace of God will be with you and walk with you through it, give you strength to endure it, and give you the future he has planned for you. God of grace, the reconciler of all things. We pray first and foremost for reconciliation. But when that's not possible, Lord, empower us to live at Mizpah. In Jesus' name, amen.